Welcome to The World Below, The War in the Heavens, a podcast exploring the adventure, the intrigue, and the magic of a land that lies beneath the celestial battle between gods and demons, a clash that has gone on since time immemorial. I'm your guide, your interlocutor, and your host, Michael Pryor. Welcome, everyone, to episode 25 of The World Below, The War in the Heavens podcast, the fifth episode of season three. This one is all about Enna the Inhuman, the second last monarch of the Anarchistian nightmare years. Hello, everyone. As usual, I'm Michael Pryor, and in this episode, the nightmare years continue. It's as if we've been 10,000 miles in the mouth of a graveyard, and there's still more to come. Stick with me, and I'll try to hold up a light. The Overview Queen Enna's reign was apparently very, very bad, but in some ways it's hard to get a handle on exactly how appalling it was, because very little survives. We have no records from Manaquist itself, and hers is one of the few reigns in the annals that doesn't have an entry, as it was expunged with great prejudice some time later. No cylinder in the Library of Souls either, which is remarkable. She has no tomb in the Royal Mausoleum, something she shares with a handful of others, but she's the only one who actually died in Anaquist. Thanks to later historians, it's been established that she came to the throne in the year 387 at the age of 62, which means that she was born in the year 325. Her reign ended with her death in the year 392, aged 67. Apart from this, we're forced to piece together some picture of her reign and the reasons behind her terrifying nickname. To do this, we're mostly going to rely on a series of accounts in records from other realms and some archaeological remains, so this is going to be an unusual episode. Fascinating, but unusual. Let's just say that bad things happened for the five years of Queen Anna's rule, apparently, but it's very difficult to gauge exactly how bad things were because we had so few Anaquistian primary sources, and also because in the reign of Enna the Inhuman, Anaquist closed its borders. All trade ceased and armies patrolled the borders to keep people out and to stop citizens from leaving. Apart from views from afar, from other places on the continent, all we have are rumours, stories and anecdotes from the few who managed to escape from Anaquist, and their stories are appalling. Anna the Inhuman didn't earn her nickname for nothing. Rain Highlights For our best account of the reign of Enna the Inhuman, Queen of Anaquist, we rely, unusually, on sources from outside Anaquist. We have to be careful with these, naturally, as some come from kingdoms and realms who weren't exactly on friendly terms with Anaquist at this time. None of them are dispassionate, objective accounts, but they're the best we have, apart from some recent tantalising discoveries that we'll get to a little later in this podcast. The first most complete account of the reign of Enna the Inhuman comes from the now long-lost kingdom of Ulm, on the far southwest corner of the continent. At the time of the reign of Queen Enna, Ulm was apparently a thriving community with the society, culture and commerce based on a now extinct plant called Bengen. Recent excavations in this area point to Ulm being a people who prized literacy with the remains of a number of libraries, all containing substantial numbers of scrolls and texts. Many of these are unreadable in a language that is still undeciphered, but others are readily legible in a variation of the common language of the world below the war in the heavens. One of these is apparently a tale from an escapee from Anaquist in the realm of Enna the Inhuman. It was apparently a very popular text, as many copies of it have been found in the ruins of Ulm, in many different buildings from the richest to the most humble. The racy content has made experts question its veracity, suspecting that the desire for sales led the author, whoever she was, to heighten the narrative with hair's breadth escapes being piled on top of hair's breadth escapes, betrayals coming thick and fast, and every page having bucket loads of heroics. 
And that's not to mention the details of the horrors inside Anaquist that the author witnessed before escaping. The writing has a certain roughness about it that adds veracity, if you like, and the unsophisticated title, I Escaped the Evil Land of Anaquist, A True Story, also supports the theory that this is indeed a work of somebody who was at least close to the events in Anaquist at the time. In short, after witnessing years of horrific events after Enna the Inhuman came to the throne, the unnamed author vows to escape the realm she'd grown up in, taking her reluctant husband with her. She gives a vivid account of a ruler who appeared to be intent on destroying not just her own family, but the realm over which they ruled. The closing of the borders was achieved with extreme brutality, and the author insists that the most callous and bloodthirsty soldiers were promoted to head the border patrols, with orders that no prisoners were to be taken. Some took their job to the next level, and the author writes in horrified tones about her first attempt at a border crossing in the east, where she was intending to get to Arenthia, but when faced with hundreds of stakes with severed heads, she was convinced that this wasn't the way to go. In the city itself, soon after Enna's coronation, squads of soldiers were sent roaming the streets, and the author compares them to rat-catchers or vermin exterminators, as they slew citizens almost at random. The author barely escaped with her life on several occasions and gave refuge to many in extremis. After twelve months of this terror, orders from the palace must have changed, because while the roaming squads continued, their target was each other and blood ran thick in the streets of Anaquist after that. While her predecessor, King Yefen, was known for his caprice, Enna the Inhuman had a more cold-blooded and organised approach to her reign. Even if her aims were opaque, her deadly and methodical approach couldn't be doubted. Upon the second anniversary of her coronation, a ghastly development took place. The roaming squads of soldiers disappeared with rumours that they were sent to border patrol and fresh troops appeared, with the aim of enslaving the entire population of Anarchist. And aside, Anarchist had never countenanced slavery. Some other realms in the history of the world below the war in the heavens had built societies upon enslavement of those taken in war or other circumstances, but the Anarchist family loathed the practice to the extent that it refused to trade with slave-based economies. Thus, the reign of Enna the Inhuman was a low point, in the history of this famed realm, and one that's spoken of in hushed tones. The author of I Escaped the Evil Land of Anarchist, a true story, was taken into slavery along with everyone in her neighbourhood, and thousands of others. In the harshest and most brutal environment, they were forced to construct a large open-air arena, or theatre, to replace the arena that had long been part of the capital. The conditions, as described by our author, were appalling, with little food and scant water. With a heavy program of manual labour, this was a self-defeating practice, but even though many, many of our author's fellow workers died of starvation, dehydration, exhaustion, sunstroke and horrific accidents, nothing changed, except the overseers became even more brutal seeing their deadlines falling behind. Our author was one of the more resilient and perhaps more cunning of those who were taken into slavery. Over months, she and her husband found the strength to tunnel out of their workers' quarters using wooden spoons. Escaping from the construction zone was only the beginning of our author's escape story, with vicious dogs being sent after them, encounters with other escaped slaves who, instead of offering help and support, were intent on killing and eating our author and her husband. And then she was fleeing from mounted patrols and only managing to lose them after being caught in an avalanche, then hiding in a cave only to find it was the home of giant poisonous lizards the size of hay wagons, then before a trek through the benighted desert to the northwest of Anaquist and staggering delirious and half-dead into the land of Perrin, where they were almost sent back to Anaquist but were smuggled onto a seaweed hauler by a sympathetic captain who took them to Alm. It's a fabulous and popular tale of most interest to us because of the accounts of what had been happening since Queen Enna took the throne of Anaquist. If even half of what the author described was true, it was a terrible, terrible time to live in Anaquist. An unusual account of the reign of 
Queen Anna comes from an unusual source, the large island of Vesbessaly to the far north of the continent. For most of the history of the world below the war in the heavens, Vesbessaly was a land of rumour and legend, a vast tropical jungle with a daunting central mountain range marked with snow and glaciers, dividing the large island roughly north and south, with most settlements on the coast and very little traffic between them apart from by sea. It is and was a land of exotic riches, strange customs and savage creatures even in the present day. Towns and even small cities in Vesbessaly have risen and fallen over thousands of years. Contact with the neighbouring continent, the home of Anaquist and the other realms, has been fruitful if erratic. Trading across the narrow straits that separate Vesbessaly from the rest of the world below the war in the heavens. One of these trading communities on the southeast coast of Vesbessaly continued trading with Anaquist during the dark reign of Enna the Inhuman. And some commercial documents have survived to the present day, recording this trade. It's fascinating to note that the exception to the closed borders was made for shipments of feathers from Vesbessaly. Feathers of a particular sort, a trade begun in the reign of Enna's brother, Yefen. The Midnight Warbler is a member of the Paradise Birds family. But whereas the other members of the family exhibit extravagantly coloured plumage, the Midnight Warbler's feathers are a striking iridescent black, a colour found nowhere else on the world below the war in the heavens. Small parcels of these feathers were shipped once a year to Anaquist, but only after the annual molt of the Midnight Warbler, it being considered extreme bad luck to hunt the birds. Feathers were gathered from the ground by those brave enough to risk the precipitous cloud forests and the prowling of the endemic land crocodiles. What these feathers were used for in Anaquist is unknown. Gesh, the small city-state to the immediate north of Anaquist, suffered during the reign of Enna the Inhuman, particularly since the mysterious weapon makers had left the realm perhaps after they'd had trouble with Enna's brother, King Yefen. Gesh experienced five major raids where the aim appeared to be to capture ordinary Geshians, enslave them and take them back to Anaquist. Military records from Gesh at the time note the helplessness with which the Geshian army tried to turn back these well-equipped raiding parties. And the Supreme Cavalier, the head of the Geshian army, was said to have cried a thousand tears when he came upon another village that had been ransacked and burned to the ground, all of its inhabitants taken. It may not have been spoken, but most Geshians wished that those who were taken were taken as slaves and not, as was whispered, as sacrifices. After the fifth incursion, a Geshian regiment volunteered to enter Anaquist to rescue the abducted Geshians, but this was rejected by the Geshian Council, the ruling body of the city-state, for fear of provoking outright war with the much larger Anaquist. This caused considerable dismay in the ranks of the soldiery, and a clandestine band of something close to 200 soldiers disobeyed orders, left their barracks and slipped over the border. They were never heard of again. Kildare was a moderately prosperous kingdom on the east coast of the continent, getting toward the far north. We have documents from the year 388, at the start of the borders closed period of Anaquist, which condemn the sinking of a merchant ship from Kildare, just outside Anaquist port of Miro. The language of the condemnation is strident, and it's clear that the sinking was unprovoked and happened without warning. The shipment was part of a monthly shipment of tropical timbers, a trade that Kildare was famous for. Despite demanding reparations, no record has been found of Anaquist handing over any money at all, or even acknowledging the incident. Trade with Kildare didn't resume for many years after the nightmare years, hence the proverb, memory like a Kildarian. Anaquist's major trading partner and rival in this 4th century was the coastal realm of Arenthia, so it's unsurprising that we have a number of sources from this mercantile nation that cover the reign of Queen Enna. The Base Anaquistians by Hallaman Drax was written in the 17th century, long after the period we're discussing. 
Its detailed account of how treacherous, duplicitous and untrustworthy the Anaquistian people are does mention particular monarchs, and it spends some time on the reign of Enna the Inhuman as an example of how sordid and evil the Anaquistians can be. It's clear in this text that Drax has a personal grudge against Anaquista and its inhabitants, and it's been suggested that he wrote it after a failed business venture. But in the chapter on Enna the Inhuman, it describes in great detail the way that Queen Enna cut a sway through the population, reducing it by nearly a third in a program of building monuments to herself. Drax lists dozens of colossal statues, including one just outside the stronghold that was nearly 40 metres tall and covered in gold. He also lists in mind-numbing detail large columnated buildings with friezes and inscriptions glorifying Queen Enna. The most spectacular construction, however, was purported to be a gigantic five-sided pyramid that towered over everything in the city, clad in white marble. It was meant to be a tomb for Enna when she died, and for Enna alone. Drax claimed that all of these statues and buildings were constructed in an astonishingly short period of time by the ruthless use of slave labour, where the fatalities were simply astronomical. Drax maintains that his account is based on eyewitnesses who saw this program of building in action, but this flies in the face of nearly every other source that asserts that getting in and out of Anaquist at this time was well nigh impossible. Further problems with substantiating Drax's claims arise because of the total and thorough erasure of anything to do with the monarchs of the nightmare years. Within a decade of the nightmare years, all traces of their rule was virtually expunged. At least, that's what was thought until fairly recently in Anaquist. In a road-building phase during the reign of King Caimon and Queen Lulia, the joint monarchs before the present Queen Sendia and King Laws, a whole neighbourhood in Lowtown was demolished, and a number of buildings and structures were uncovered, including something that could have been the foundation of the five-sided pyramid mentioned by Drax. If so, it was a vast edifice and would have been truly striking. The Anna Diaries In the late 1600s, Jostas Flaminia, a librarian in Tras on the central western coast of the continent, claimed to have found the personal diary of Queen Enna. He said he found it jammed between the pages of an ancient volume on the care and husbandry of Calcus goats, a breed that died out in the 1200s. He also claimed that this diary was written in Queen Enna's own hand and full of details hitherto unknown and raw in the extreme. Naturally, this caused a sensation and not just in Anarchist. Demands were made for the return of the diary while scholars and wealthy types from across the continent clamoured to buy it. Justus Flaminia and the diary disappeared for some time after the library was stormed by a gang of soldiers of fortune seeking the diary. Flaminia was sick at home, and he'd taken the diary with him. Soon after, Flaminia disappeared, and fears were held for his safety until he let it be known that he was in hiding, and he'd release sections of the diary to a printer he'd made a deal with. Over the next year, copies of segments from this purported diary were sold to the public, and it was a phenomenon right across the continent. Crowds gathered at the printing works on the day of each release, and fisticuffs often broke out. Such was the desire to get hold of an early copy. After a number of segments were released, some began to raise doubts about its authenticity. Scholars and historians pointed to anachronisms and obvious inaccuracies in the text, but so salacious was it that the public poo-pooed these reservations and continued to buy the segments in huge numbers. The printing works became fabulously wealthy, open branches right across the continent, and the still covert Justus Flaminia raked it in. Eventually, though, the mounting discrepancies couldn't be ignored, and it started to become clear that the narrative was becoming slapdash and careless, perhaps as the good life became too much for Flaminia. When the latest segment plainly contradicted most of the early chapters and had Queen Enna in four places at the same time, even the most ardent admirers began to speak of the diary as a work of fiction. 
Sales fell but still remained robust as, let's face it, the public was hooked. Jostas Flaminia spun out the diary as much as he could, but after three years, in 1689, in the joint monarchy of Yemen II and Wenkanti III, he brought it to a close. Immediately, he was kidnapped from what was now a salubrious country estate, brought to Anarchist and charged with forgery. His defence was novel. He never claimed that the diary was authentic. He simply never corrected anyone's misapprehensions. Clearly, he said, one look at the diary would have seen that it was in his handwriting, with modern penmanship. The magistrate must have been a fan because she found this convincing and cleared him of all charges. Justus Flaminia went on to star in a stage production of The Life of Enna the Inhuman, which had some success, particularly in more out-of-the-way parts of the continent. An Archaeological Discovery Early in the reign of Queen Sendia and King Laws, the present monarchs of Anaquist, renovations in the south wing of the royal palace brought to light a hitherto unknown room in the Emerald Apartments, a minor residential section of the south wing, unused since the reign of Queen Misty II in the 15th century. The Emerald Apartments were in disrepair, and the new King Laws took it upon himself to completely refurbish and redesign them, with the view of making them the new royal living quarters. When a dividing wall was broken down, a small windowless room was revealed, full of rubble. The workers at first assumed it was simply infill, but as they started to remove the broken masonry, they began to come across artefacts that looked many hundreds of years old. The king was informed and he hurried to the construction site, bringing with him scholars from the Great Library, the temple and the hypogeum. Construction was halted and a more careful excavation began. Once cleared, it was revealed that one of the walls was clad in various marble slabs, the colours and patterns pointing to the fact that they were from the other side of the continent. On this wall was an inscription that indicated that this room was a private chamber of Queen Enna herself, a room that was dedicated to entertainment. This aroused much excitement, as almost nothing of this period had survived, as I mentioned earlier. When the nightmare years ended, remember that a deliberate program of obliteration was undertaken, and evidence from the worst of these times, the reign of Enna the Inhuman, was almost entirely eradicated. It's only through much later scholars that we know anything about the reigns of these dread monarchs. For a time, of some centuries, even their names were unspoken. After more careful removal of rubble and debris, several intricate mosaics were uncovered on the floor, as well as extremely fragile frescoes on other walls, and through the scenes depicted, the nature of Queen Enna's nightmarish entertainments became obvious. One scholar had a breakdown after viewing them and had to retire to a country branch of the temple. He never spoke another word after seeing what he saw. Rumours persisted that actual skeletons were found broken and tumbled together in a pit, but this is unsubstantiated. Perhaps the most remarkable find in this sealed-off room, discovered near the bottom of all the detritus, were two coins, one of which bore the only likeness of Queen Enna the Inhuman that's known to exist. In profile, as all Anaquistian monarchs are on their coins, she is represented as a striking young woman with an elaborate hairstyle pulled back from her forehead and held in place with what was probably a richly jewelled headband. Her shoulders are bare. The other coin is mysterious. Neither sign has the portrait of the monarch, even though the inscription clearly states that the coin belongs right in the middle of Enna's brief reign. Apart from the standard inscriptions, both sides are decorated with stylized feathers. One side, with the feathers pointing upward, the other in irregular fan shapes. The coins were the only thing that King Law was allowed to be taken from the room before it was sealed again, and they're on display in the relics room of the royal palace. Much conjecture has arisen about the feathered coin, as it's become known, ranging from symbols of death to coins used in gaming houses, but these conjectures have to remain what they are, guesses without foundation. On the orders of the king, the room was sealed up again. 
At first he was going to preserve it as a record of the horrors of the time, the frescoes and mosaics depicting tortures and cruelty beyond belief, all presided over by the crown figure that was clearly Queen Enna. He then decided that the room was simply too much, would be too damaging to the people, and it was sealed up. Personal life. I have to admit that we have nothing here, almost nothing anyway. With some of the reconstructive work that later historians have done, it's generally accepted that she was in her 60s when she came to the throne. And from some details that have survived from the time of her successor, Queen Keska, we can be fairly sure that Enna gave birth to Keska when she was only 15 years old. We have no record of how she died, which seems appropriate for one of the most shadowy figures in this dark, dark period of history in the world below the war in the heavens. Apart from this, we only have stories of Enna as a monster, someone who indulged in some of the wickedest behaviour ever seen in Anarchist, as well as someone who felt that the entire state could be used for her own glory. Last words. So that's the shadowy and somewhat mysterious reign of Enna the Inhuman. Well, I've tried to cobble together as much as I could to give some idea of this evil ruler. Let it be said that she probably wouldn't fill any spot on the top ten best Anarchistian monarch lists anywhere. And that's it for episode 26 of the World Below the War in the Heavens podcast. Coming up next, the Demon Temple. Until then, farewell and may the heavens smile upon you. This has been The World Below the War in the Heavens, a podcast exploring the history, culture and esoterica of the world below, a continent of magic and mystery with inhabitants who keep one eye on the sky at all times. I've been your host, Michael Pryor. If you'd like to find out more about me and my books, pop over to www.michaelpryor.com.au. Farewell. Farewell.